Hello, movie people. Welcome to a new episode of The Cine Guy. I'm your host, Steven Angulo. Let's talk film. Happy New Year, everybody. Wow, it's it's finally over. Oh, my gosh. Here I was thinking we were going to be stuck in 2020 forever. <laughs> but nope, it's 2021. Hopefully, it's not a sequel. DC has returned with another movie. Man, it has been a long time since... Actually, no. Birds of Prey came out last February, so... But instead of Harley Quinn, we finally got a sequel starring the only good superhero in Joss Whedon's Justice League. That's right, I said it. Until a Santa comes out, that trash we saw in theaters is no will no longer count. Wonder Woman 1984 brings back our the titular, our favorite titular hero in an era that we all know and love. The 80s. That's right. There's so many movies taking place in the dark and gloomy side of comic books. The sun finally came up in DC. And now we're here enjoying a new Wonder Woman adventure. Only this time, she's going up against Pedro Pascal as Maxwell Lord, who plans on taking over the world with the use of a dream stone. No, seriously, that's the plot. A stone that you make wishes to and it comes to life. Also, Cheetah, the most well-known adversary for Wonder Woman, is here. Though, it kind of feels like she shouldn't even be there in the first place. Because she's just there. Also, Chris Pine is back. Why? Because we loved him in the first movie. And how did he come back 70 years later? Uh, we're about to find out. So yeah, we've got quite the cast, quite the storyline. So why did I feel like this movie was so tame compared to the first one, which was, which was an explosive war superhero movie? I mean, Wonder Woman is a warrior. She has to be in a war, so the whole World War One setting is just brilliant. Like, she's there showing, you know, girl power. She's taking on the enemy and all that stuff. She's saving lives. She's just being awesome. But how come I didn't get the same thrill from this one? I mean, it's the same hero and different, ba different background era. So where was the, you know... Where was the excitement? Well, it's the 80s, the age of color and corniness, which does deliver, though, because that mall scene was super corny. I was expecting, I don't know, maybe Deadpool to appear like, oh, hey, I'm in the wrong movie. That's my bad. But, yeah, I mean, it was just Wonder Woman, you know, fighting crime and nobody gets hurt. It's just she's holding a guy upside down and shaking his... I don't, know, I don't think he's choking, she's choking anything, but still, he's only upside down, she's she, she's pretty much, like, making fun of them and all that stuff, but, like, I don't know, compared to, like, compared to, like, the warrior I saw in the first movie, who's pretty much, you know, deflecting bullets and just, like, breaking guys in half, I'm seeing somebody who, I don't know, she, she punches a guy into this, like, this, like, thing, and she's, like, spinning on a giant circle, like, it just feels a little too cartoony to me. And very bright, too. So the whole MacGuffin is this dream stone that once you touch it, you can make a witch. I mean, Cheetah's character, Barbara Minerva, she used it to become special, like Wonder Woman. She wanted to be liked, pretty much. So she's a nobody who's very kind, full of, full of heart and joy, and she just wants to be badass, pretty much. How many times have we seen that before in superhero films? And what does Diana wish for? Bring back Steve Trevor. Okay. I kind of agree. I kind of like that whole part, of like you know, let's bring back Chris Pine. But the way it happens, kind of weird. I thought it was just gonna appear out of nowhere, like, "Whoa, I'm still alive. Where am I right now?" And then look for Diana. But no, what does he do? He possesses another man. Like we're looking at a guy in a different body. Well, to Wonder Woman, all she sees is Steve Trevor. But to the real world, it's just a random dude that nobody cares for. So. They brought back a favorite character from the first movie by turn by having him take over some uh, some random dude's life, and that pretty much tell that pretty much says that Wonder Woman slept with a random dude, who's oh my god, it's supposed to be Steve Trevor in a different dude's body. So, um, ring ring help consent police. But the chemistry is always a delight, all right? Chris Pine delivers in his role as a fish out of water in this new era. It's kind of like a role reversal. Diana was more like the, you know, the, um, oh, what is this? This is ice cream. What's going on here? She doesn't know about the world because she's been living there mascara her whole life. So now it's the other way around. She's introducing him to the 80s. Look, there's art. We can fly a jet now. Now back to Barbara Minerva. Everybody was so excited to finally see, see Cheetah in the, in the, on the big screen. It would have been amazing. 
but I don't know, like the the quirkiness at first kind of made her seem like a Saturday Night Live character. Like all I see is Target Lady, but she's a gemologist. I think that's what it's called. And then when she's Cheetah, she's this like vicious uh, alpha predator who's here to like, you know ready for blood and everything. So why did I feel like her character was kind of unnecessary? Like if the movie was just Wonder Woman vs. Maxwell Lord, okay, it wouldn't make sense. But then they just they kind of just drew Cheetah in there, who's supposed to be like the like pretty much the biggest like villain for Wonder Woman, that kind of like her Green Goblin, but she just got pushed aside. Like no, we should explore more about her. And I don't know. I do hope that if, when they do make Wonder Woman three, they bring her back because I don't think she renounced a wish. No, she's still gonna be Cheetah. So maybe like a future movie, maybe like a potential appearance, will kind of redeem her as like a stronger, more well developed character. And Maxwell Lord. He's not a very well-known character, but in the comics, he's pretty big. I mean, this is the guy who murdered Blue Beetle, who managed the Justice League for his own greedy purposes, and uh, hijacked uh, Batman's contingency plan to take down the League. So, yeah, it was like, we're, we're about to get, like, the DC version of William Stryker, because this, this guy hates superheroes. So, it was exciting to see him on the big screen, but what do we what do we get? A guy with a Hispanic accent who's a businessman, he's very, very cheesy in a way. I mean, he's power hungry, he's very energetic, like, you know, always moving all over, like, hey, help me help you and all that stuff. So, I don't know, this guy just feels more like a challenge for Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Like, you could have switched these roles apart and nobody would tell the difference. The only problem with his character is the final act, alright? Pedro soars. He, he's a lot of fun. And he, you know, he does a good job as a villain. But the whole thing with the final act is like, okay... So Maxwell Lord is is the Dreamstone. That's what that was his wish. So he's making all these wishes. Next thing you know, the world is falling apart, nuclear war, and all that stuff. So Dan is like, "Quick, renounce your wish, save the world." Okay, that makes sense. But like, I don't know. Like, I was kind of hoping that Maxwell Lord would be like an actual threat. Instead, they kind of humanize him a bit, and that's where his son comes in, Alistair. Who I don't even I don't even know if it's comic book accurate, but. The whole thing, like him going back to save him from the chaos, because he didn't renounce his wish, all for his son. Like, okay, it's nice to be, you know, humanize the character because the whole purpose of the first Wonder Woman movie was like humanity is worth is worth saving because they can be good. So, yes, here Wonder Woman kill in the first one movie. Wonder Woman destroys Ares and just brutally murders him, but here she's all like, "Be good, Max." Go back to your son. Be good. I mean, we're talking about the guy whom she breaks his neck in the comic books. Now, I know there's a whole thing between breaking necks in the DC Universe. I mean, I would not have mind watching that, but I don't know. It would have been more fun to watch um, Max Lord be consumed by the power of the Dreamstone. Next thing you know, he's reduced to ashes. Like, okay... That's that's how much that's like the consequence of having too much power. I would have loved to have seen that, but no, he's just gonna go back to being a father and I guess a failed businessman. Yay! The first DC movie where pretty much nobody dies. I saw everything. Mostly because of Easter eggs. The Invisible Jet is there. Yay! So she suddenly realized that she has the power to make things invisible. Yeah, that could have been very useful during World War One. But no, let's save it for the second movie, 70 years later, after another, after like two more wars, and then one of them was like, oh, by the way, I can turn, I can make things turn invisible. That could have been so useful during, with the allies. And of course, we got Hans Zimmer's epic soundtrack. I mean, he brought back beautiful life from Batman vs. Superman, and it's gonna see like the, the DC Universe theme. All about, like, it's so beautiful and haunting. It's all about, like, you know, making your sacrifice and realizing that life isn't the way the way you want it to be. But in a way, it can be better. Overall, it's still a fun comic book movie full of e great Easter eggs and great performances. Though, I would have said, you know, maybe, like, tone down the humor and definitely establish your villains a little bit more. But other than that, I mean, I guess you have to be the judge. If you're a DC Comics fan, you decide, all right? It's up to you what you if you if whether you like this movie or not. All right, so my final rating is going to be 7.6 high heels out of 10 invisible jets.
All right, guys, so if you enjoyed this episode, leave a like, you did, subscribe, and join the crew, and I'll see you next time for another awesome review. Be sure to check out the Instagram page at CineGuySteven for more fun reviews. That is at CineGuySteven. All right, hope you guys have a great new year. This is Steven Gula signing off. That's a wrap.